Hello, everybody. Today, I want to tell you a bit about the Lie derivative. So this is adapted from a lecture I gave to my symplectic geometry and mecha classical mechanics class. So I'm assuming some familiarity with the language of stuff like vector fields and differential forms. And I'll be using some symplectic stuff as, as motivation, but I'll define the terms when I get to them. So to start, let's say we have a vector field on our face space. Our face space is a manifold, our vector field defines a section of the tangent bundle. Basically, at every point, I give you a tangent vector, right? And what can you do with these vector fields? Well, you can flow along them, right? So the vector field defines a derivative of basically a path. So the natural question is, can I find a path whose derivative is always a vector field? This is called a trajectory. It's a map from R to my phase space, such that its derivative is the vector field at that point. Um, and we can see that these sort of trace on along flow lines of the vector field, which is a very sensible thing for something called a trajectory to do. So this lets us define a flow function. Essentially, given a starting point, I can say, let's just move along the associated trajectory for time t and see where we end up. Now, if we do that to all points of the manifold and move them all at time t, then we basically shift, you know, we're, we're sort of pushing everything around and we get what's called the flow function. It's a map from the phase space to itself. And this has some nice properties. For instance, if x, our vector field, is differentiable, then we know the flow is reversible. Essentially, this is because of Picard Lindelof, which you might have encountered before. So this is a theorem on ODEs, which says a first order ODE has a unique solution. It always has a unique solution. And this right here is a first order ODE. So it says that flowing by time t, I will always get to a unique place, which means that none of my points will actually collide with each other as they flow along. So that means that we can consider a flow of negative t. We can flow backwards in time, which is nice because if I, you know, if I compose my flowing forwards in time with my flowing backwards in time, then I'm going to get, well, the times just add, right? So that I just get back where I started, right? Flowing at no time at all. Just stay in the same place. It's the identity. Now, the flow is interesting because it acts on these differentiable um, critters we've been considering, these vector fields, these differentials, because it sort of invects and distorts things, right? For example, if I start with these two vectors here, and as I move them along, as we can see come to flow, they kind of get squashed and they, they, they push to get together. So I get this, this map and I can consider um, what this map actually looks like. It's called the push forward of the flow. It tells you how my vectors, my infinitesimal vectors distort. So it's basically saying, um, what is it at a point P? Well, flow back, flow back from P to get your starting point, and then just take the derivative of the map um, and multiply those vectors. It's the definition of derivative. So this defines the push forward of a vector field under the flow. Which brings us to the Lie derivative, or in what I think is a more evocative name, the Fisherman's derivative. And the Lie derivative basically says, okay, let's look at this, the vector field as it goes through the fisherman's net and look at, you know, its different values over time. So here's the first one, and then it affects some time t, and you get the second, and then the third. And then the question is, how does that change? And that quantity is the Lie derivative, basically. It's just a time derivative of the, well, of the, what's called the push forward of, of y. What happens when you affect y under the flow, evaluated at a given point. In other words, Lie derivatives, Lie derivatives in general are the change you get from advection in some stationary reference frame. We can apply these to um, differential forms too. So I'm going to define what this is. Essentially, um, we have the push forward of the differential form under some flow. So this is the flow, We're taking the push forward 
of, let's call, eta a differential form. How do we define it? Well, differential forms are defined with respect to integration, right? So if eta is integrated over some region s, um, and the question is, what is the integral of the push forward of epsilon? Well, that's just, you know, the epsilon itself over the push forward in the region, right? So, for example, you have epsilon over here. Um, so the integral of the push forward of epsilon on S equals the integral of epsilon on S prime. That's what I'm calling this push forwarded region here. Right, so where, so basically you infect the integration region by the flow, and in fact, if you turn this into a local formula, you can see that this actually is the same as our notion of a leader derivative for vector fields, just when you take the dual of everything properly. Okay, so that means we can write down the lead derivative um, in terms of an integral over some region, and that's just going to be the derivative of of the pullback of the differential form, which is the derivative of essentially the moved region. And then we can take the definition of a derivative by just a limit of 1 over t of the difference of um, well, epsilon at the starting point and then minus epsilon at t. And then we can just combine these two things into a single integration over just a, a different region. t goes to 0, 1 over t, integral of s minus s t epsilon. Okay. So essentially, you integrate epsilon over this part, and then you integrate it over this part. And then you subtract the results. And then, basically, you're looking at the rate of change of that quantity. So that's the lead derivative. So it gives you a nice linear map from p forms to p forms. Um, and it's called the Lie derivative because this is actually a derivation just in the same way that the exterior derivative is, which is nice. Um, yeah, so just to write this in a different way, just on the level of forms, we define it to be the time derivative of the pullback of the differential form. Awesome. So now here's the question. What is the Lie derivative of the symplectic form with respect to a Hamiltonian vector field? In other words, if I have, so just to recall some definitions, um, so we have omega satisfies d omega equals zero, omega non-degenerate, And omega is a two-form, right? That's a symplectic form. And then we have Hamilton's equations, which is for a Hamiltonian, which is, you know, a function on phase space. We're defining a vector field, and that vector field, xh, satisfies omega of xh comma blank, right? So if you just plug in xh into one entry of omega, then the resulting thing is linear in one in one function. It's going to be a one form, and that one form is just the exterior derivative of h, the differential of h. So that's Hamilton's equations. Okay, so we want to calculate, well, this thing. And in fact, what we want to show is that this equals zero, which implies that since this is the rate of change of omega of some region, as that region moves around, this implies that the integral over s omega equals integral over s t omega, right? So we want to show that this is true. So the way we do that is, um, well, here we see s and we see s t, which we get by advecting it along some vector field, the vector field x h, right? And this region, it sweeps out, it sweeps out the cylinder. So the idea is we're going to find this, you know, Suffice to say that the integral of omega over s minus st is zero. We're going to use Stokes' theorem by integrating the differential of omega over our cylinder, right? Because then 
um, we can relate the integral over the interior with the integral over the boundary of omega of this. And the integral over s and s prime are, are part of the boundary. Now, the thing, the thing is, we know this, right, that's just equal to zero, since it's, you know, a symplectic form, it's going to be closed, right? Which means that we can relate, we can basically figure out this difference by looking at the other part of the boundary. So, let's do that. So, here we have essentially two parts of the boundary. We have A up here, which is the top and bottom, and then if we orient things correctly like this, then the integral over A, omega equals zero. We want to show this. But by Stokes' theorem, um, we have this other thing here, and since the integral over the interior of d omega is zero, we know that integral over a omega integral integral over b omega. Okay. So now we just have to figure out what this is. So we want to find the integral of the symplectic form over this, like this little cylindrical collar b, the walls of the cylinder. And we want to show that this equals zero. So I guess it's better. I'll try to like this. Is it equal to zero? Okay, so to do that we're going to use the fact that we're going to use the limit as t goes to zero specifically. So limit t goes to zero of 1 over t integral b omega. Because in that limit what you find is that this region here you know, the distance between the two things on, along the collar goes to zero. So, essentially, once it gets small enough, the, in, the value of omega is constant along t direction, where this, this xh, this Hamiltonian vector field, gives us the t direction, right? Um... So as, if you just look at one little region of this, um, essentially as you take this integral, we can write b in a different way as the integral over s cross i, where the i parameterizes xh. And t goes to zero, one over t. And then essentially by, remember, this is how we to find how differential forms work in the first place. They act as infinitesimal integrals. When you turn the integration region to be infinitesimally small and scale it accordingly, then your differential form turns into a local thing, which is a functional on the vectors that you're integrating over. So we're only doing this in one direction this time, so what we get is that, essentially, the only thing this, this, this result depends on is the value of the differential form along s. So we should be integrating a one form. So what one form is that? Well, it's omega of x h comma blank. Right? Now we know what this is by Hamilton's equations. Okay. And now we know what this is by Stokes' theorem. But that's zero because it's a closed loop. Right, the boundary of this loop is empty. You're integrating a, an exact form over a closed loop. This will always be zero. So, we have zero is integral over b omega equals integral over a omega, which implies that lambda t goes to zero of one over t s prime omega equals zero, or l x omega is zero. Okay. I mean, alternatively, we can look at this in the integrated version. So this is the infinitesimal one, but over a whole integral, it says that, um, you know, integral over s omega equals integral over s t omega for all t. Or, for the differential form side, it says that omega is the pullback of the flow omega. Okay? And said another way, so omega preserved 
by the Hamiltonian vector field. So what does this say? This says that the phase space structure, remember, the flow of the Hamiltonian vector field describes how your phase space evolves with, with changing time under the Hamiltonian evolution. And this says that omega, which characterizes the phase space structure, does not change as you do that, right? As it should. This is exactly what you want, because think about, think about it, like, you'd be in some pretty hot water if your phase space structure started changing over time as you evolved in that phase space, right? At least, you know, intuitively, like, this is a really fundamental property of, of Hamiltonian dynamics. It says that phase space is preserved under the dynamics. Great. And in fact, this is almost a converse. The converse is almost true, right? Like, any vector field which preserves the symplectic form implies that x is locally Hamiltonian, meaning that x equals xh on some open set, um, on any on any sufficiently small open set. So that is to say, basically, you know, the structure of allowed evolutions in phase space, things that, like, play nice with the phase space structure is exactly the Hamiltonian evolution. That's pretty cool. So let's put a box around this. Now I want to mention that this is actually a specific example of a more general phenomena, which goes by the wonderful name of Cartan's magic formula. <clears throat> So this is a very explicit way to take the lead derivative of a vector field in terms of just simple operators of the interior derivative and exterior derivative. So to define this, the interior derivative is just the plug-in x operator that we were doing before. So omega of x, h, comma, blank, that's the interior derivative of x, h acting on omega. It takes a so this is something which takes a p form to a p minus 1 form, because you're plugging in a vector. So Carton's magic formula. So we have like two natural operations to do on differential forms. We can either decrease the rank by plugging in a vector or increase the rank by taking a derivative. And if we want to get back to the same rank form, we could do that in two ways. We could decrease and increase. Or we could do the other way around. So Carton's magic formula says that the lead derivative is just the sum of these two operations. Um, and the proof of this is actually pretty much the same thing. The only issue is we don't know that the inside of the volume, you know, the inside of the cylinder here, is going to give you zero because um, the form's not necessarily closed. But that means we have to get this other term here. But this other term comes from including the contribution of the inside. And, you know, using the same argument we did before about how integration in this low time limit actually corresponds to the interior derivative, um, we can apply that to the whole base of the cylinder too. Um, and, you know, the whole argument goes through. So I guess it's a little bit of an exercise for the reader. And this is called the magic formula because it really is kind of magic. Like, you just plug stuff in and it, it just works. And it's, it's really nice to have around. So, for example, let's see how we got the last result using this formula. So L of xh acting on omega. So the Hamiltonian vector field on the differential form, we plug it in. Um, so there's two terms. The first one goes away because the symplectic form is closed. And the second one, uh, well, that just the interior derivative, by definition, it just gives you the dh. So L X, the lead derivative along a Hamiltonian vector field of the symplectic form is d d h is just zero. There, we got back what we wanted. So hopefully this makes you a little bit less scared whenever you see 
and fancy lead derivatives popping up in places. 